this morning, <clears throat> we want to talk about the church. Now, there's a couple of things that provoke this. Now, one was VBS, and I was so grateful for all the, again, the, all the volunteers. We had a great, great uh, turnout of volunteers um, to work. We had more volunteers than we had kids, and that's a good thing, but then that sometimes that's not a great so. Uh, not such a great thing or not such a good thing, uh, but it was great, and I want to say thank you. And, um, but I got to thinking about the future, and not just the future of New Beginning, but the future of the church. And of course, uh, the church today, and I'm not just talking about uh, the, the church at large all throughout the world, because there's a global church, the universal church of God, and then there's the local church that's here in First Baptist and Northport Baptist. And then <clears throat> we are the personal church, uh, the, the temple of God. There's the personal temple, the local temple, the global temple. And so uh, when, my, when I say the church, I'm, I'm not talking about necessarily um, the born-again people, but I'm talking about the group of people that come together in assemblies. We know from the parables of the, of, uh, in the Gospels, the parable of the kingdom of heaven, that uh, everyone that's in church is not saved. We get that, and we understand that. And uh, all that glitters isn't gold, and all the who say they believe in Jesus don't really believe in Jesus. They believe in the person of Jesus. They just don't believe in the work and they haven't committed their life to Christ. So when I make this statement that the church as it exists today is in trouble, I mean that the global church is in trouble and the local church is in trouble. Because we are moving away from the church as it was founded in the book of Acts. We're moving away from that. And we're moving towards Revelation chapter 3 the church of Laodicea, the apostate church, the lukewarm church that God says, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. But yet in grace and mercy says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and will open up, I will come in and sup with him and him with me. That even to the apostate church that Jesus is knocking on the door. And so we need to understand that the church again is made up of believers and pseudo-believers. But let's read these texts and sit down, and then we'll just discuss them for a moment. And again, I want you to just kind of pray through and just say, right now when we're getting ready to pray after we read the, the Word, just say, Lord, help me to hear what your Spirit is saying to the church, all right? So let's stand to our feet. We're going to read Matthew 16, verses 15 through 19. Then we're going to flip, and we're going to go to Acts 2, verses 40 through 47. <clears throat> all right, here we go. <clears throat> Acts 16, 15 through 19. He said to them, that's Jesus to the apostles, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. <clears throat> and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades, or Hades, shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And by the way, you're holding those in your hand, the scriptures. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Meaning that I'm going to permit you to act on my behalf, and if you bind it, I'll bind it. And if you loose it, I'll loose it. I'm going to give you that authority. Now let's turn to Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, verse 40, reading through 47. This is Peter now standing up before the multitudes on the day of Pentecost. Verse 40, and with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs 
were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the behold, we become. As we look at and ponder and have our minds renewed, we are changed. But help us to understand that this takes desire, and diligence, and effort so that we can become what you want us to become. Let the church hear what the Spirit is saying this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, as we've read in these scriptures, has promised to build his church. The word church in Greek is ekklesia. It simply means those who have been called out. That God calls us out of the world to himself and sets us apart as an individual in salvation and as a church in corporate salvation through a body of believers. The church is a called out body of believers globally, locally, and we become the body of Christ. Meaning that God's eternal purpose has been that Jesus is going to be the head and the church is going to be his body. And through the church, through his body, God is going to demonstrate himself and his plan and his, his mercy and his, his, his son, the gospel, to the world. That he's going to do that through the church. That God's eternal plan is that the church, that's us. When I say church, think about say, that's me. The church for representing him here on the earth. That there's a body of believers. Now we're talking about the local church. A body of believers in community that's held together by the koinonia. That's the word in verse 42 of Acts. When it says uh, fellowship, that's the Greek word koinonia. It means the unity of community that is facilitated by the Holy Spirit. That when the Holy Spirit convicts of sin and reveals Christ, and we come to faith that God separates us out of the world, and I'm not going to talk about all the aspects of personal redemption and salvation, but immediately he separates us and puts us into a body of believers called the church, a community of people who are united and empowered uh, and anointed by the Holy Spirit for a purpose. For a purpose that we, as the body, might show to the world Christ. And what we need to understand is, is that God has designed that for every single member. Everyone that's born again is a member of the body of Christ. And then we come into membership or community in a local church. And if God is going to show the fullness of who he is and what he, uh, what he can be and what he will do in the life of, uh, of a believer to the world, it takes everybody participating. It takes everybody participating. It takes everybody understanding that. That through the local church, the mighty work of God will be displayed. And Christ will be glorified. And the scripture says that from the time that we got saved, that God is working in us as part of the church to reveal himself. Jesus in Matthew 16 said, I will build my church. Meaning that you are currently under construction and that new beginning as a local body is under construction and that um, you know five points baptist is under construction and northport baptist and northport church of god and northport church of christ we're under construction god is building something now here's the mentality that we need to bring to the table 
God's building something, and God is doing something in me, and God is doing something through me, and part of what God wants to do is build his local church, and we're just going to talk about New Beginning this morning. It would apply to any other church on the face of the planet, particularly in the Western world, but we need to come to church with the understanding that God is building something. Now, anybody that's in the construction business knows this, that if you hired them, they need to be working because you're going to be paying them for doing nothing if they're not. And so God wants you and I, when we signed up to be a part of Christ, and now we become part of his body, he didn't sign me up to stand over there and watch somebody else work. He signed me up to get my tool pouch on and to find out where I can get started. And then after we see what I can do and can't do, guide me into the place where I can be most effective. Amen. And God has given to us, the whole book of Corinthians is about this, Romans mentions this as well, that God has gifted every one of you as believers in Christ. God has spiritually enabled you by the Holy Spirit, to be a contributor to, the, to this building process. That he gives us spiritual gifts. That word gifts there is charismata or charisma. It simply means the divine enablement of the Spirit of God. At any point in time, God can use you to do anything in the body. Okay? So don't, don't label yourself, well, I don't have that gift. You, you might not have it today, but you might have it this afternoon depending on what God wants to do and how God might want to use you to be doing it. So Christ is building the church. We can understand that. Secondly, we can understand that in the building of the church, he told them in Matthew 16, that hell can't stop it. That the power and the gate, that the gates, the word gates there means the authority of, hell cannot stop what I'm building. But understand this, it's going to try. Hell is going to try to stop the building process that God is doing in the church. And he's not going to do it in a blatant, obvious way. He's going to do it in a subtle way. I'm setting myself up for the great disappointment at the end here. He's going to do it in a subtle way. He would never come out and go, that's stupid. He's just going to tell you that that's okay, but this is better. He dresses himself up in an armor of light. He, he makes himself as, a, an, as another Christ. He, he, and his enemies, he dresses up as angels of light. That's why we have to have great discernment. And great discernment is not just what you think about it. Discernment comes from what God says about it that you think about it. It's not a good idea if it's not Scripture. I'm setting myself up. I'm going somewhere. I'm trying to pad my fall. And he said, I'm going to give you. He he said, I'm going to build my church, but the angels of hell are going to come against it. But I've given to you the keys to the kingdom, this book. Now, here's where I'm going with this. I mentioned at the beginning that the church is moving away from how it was founded in the Scriptures, how it was organized in the Scriptures. And what we're doing is is we're moving away from the model and the method by how God has designed the church to be effective. And the farther we move away from that, the less effective we become. The less effective we become, the less our light shines to the world. The less the world has respect for the church. The less people are inclined to be involved in it the less people see the importance of it because they think it's one and done instead of understanding that it's still being built and that we're still called to labor in the harvest and that we're still called to invest in God's church and in God's plan. And we have become a commuter church. Here a while, there a while. Out a while, nowhere a while, back in, somewhere else, back out. We've become a consumer church, shopping for churches based on what they can do for us. What do they have for kids? What do they have for youth? What do they have for college kids? 
What do they have for old folks? What do they have for uh, folks my age? How many 30-year-olds are in there? How many 60-year-olds are in there? That's how we look at it. That ain't Bible. That ain't Bible. That's consumerism. That, that's, that's floating in and floating out, being tickled, being entertained, and then out again. Or staying for a while and moving on, and we call it season. Season. Here's what Jesus said. In John 13, 34, this is one of the keys to the, to the kingdom. This is scripture. John 13, 34. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John 15, 12. This is my commandment that you love one another. Now, let's pay a couple of attention. Let's pay attention to a couple of phrases here. Love, love, love one another. Well, if that was natural, that wouldn't have to be commanded. You've got to learn how to love people. It's under construction. God's working on me. Amen. And you know why you have to do that? Because you get together with other people. And we all love ourselves. That's consumerism. And God's trying to transition us from being consumers, lovers of ourselves, takers, into being lovers of others, givers investors in other words from going from here to here to here to see what I can get I need to find where God wants me to be so I can give because God's building something he's building something and he's given me something to build with now I didn't bring all the tools to do all the work but I brought my tools and there's a place on the wall there's a place in the church there's a place in the body where you are supposed to be and you're supposed to be rooted and grounded and built up and you're supposed to be affecting everything that takes place on this wall. Because as you take care of your place in the wall and then I take care of my place in the wall and then brother so-and-so takes care of his place in the wall, now the Spirit of God is not moving through three individuals, but God, the Spirit of God is moving through one body. And God is doing something so big that if you just do it by yourself, it won't make a difference. But if you get you a bunch of folks and start on one thing, pretty soon you'll be able to see where God is making a difference. You put one man out there with a brick, it doesn't make a difference. You put 40 men out there with a ton of bricks, and all of a sudden the whole world can see what you're doing. God has no orphans, or if we put it in construction terms, God has no unemployed. And you're supposed to be a part of a local church. And you're supposed to come to church with your tool belt on and your Bible in your hand, your authority, your keys to the kingdom. And you're supposed to fall out there in that parking lot and say, what are we working on today? What are we going to build today? Because, man, I want to be a part of something that the world can see it. And God gets glorified. Amen. Oh, man, let me take a break here. People who stand apart from God's church, who stand alone, who are uninterested or uninvolved, have a heart problem. Love, love, love. Love one another. Care for one another. The world will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. And see, when we're not involved, when we're not interested, when we don't show up, when we're not committed it simply reveals the carnality that is the self-love that we possess more so than the love of others
the love of Christ ultimately. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So disobedience shows that we have a love problem. And we say it all the time, I love Jesus, yes I do, I love Jesus, how about you? But Jesus said, here's how you show me that you love me. Go love your brother. Go love your church. And be my body. And be effective. TV church, unless you broke or busted or laid up or so old you can't get out, it's not where you become effectual. In other words, if you can get out, get up and get out and go down, to some local church, that's where you need to be. Yes, I believe in taking a vacation. And no, you don't have to go to church on vacation. I get it. Don't, don't bring me those petty arguments. You know what I'm talking about. You need to be a viable, vital laborer in God's house so that God can work through our labors together to give a testimony to the world of himself. The church has always been God's eternal plan to show the world his glory. It's the primary way for individual believers to walk out their faith and to carry out their work together with other believers. Everywhere you see in the Bible God's working, he's working through one person or two people to to organize, communicate, and build up a larger group of people. Abraham becomes Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who becomes the 12 sons, who becomes a nation. Jesus has 12 disciples who write the scriptures that win the nations. And God is always working through his people. God is working through his people for his people. For the benefit of others. Now let's go to Acts chapter 2 and look at verses 41. Peter's preaching Jesus crucified, resurrected, the Messiah of God, and 3,000 people get saved. And then look at what it says in verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, that means their teachings, and fellowship in the breaking of bread and prayers. And prayers, I'm not going to preach on so much today, but I'm going to get to it because that's something that God's really been weighing my heart about for us to get together. They prayed together. They prayed together. But let's look at this phrase, continued steadfastly. In some of the translations of the Bible, that word there, that phrase there, <clears throat> is devoted. It, it says, instead of, instead of reading, they continued steadfastly it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles doctrine and fellowship the word devotion means to be zealous for to be strongly affectionate and to be committed and dedicated we don't have much of that anymore in any of life the the, the nature of of the fallen human nature, as we talked about in our Sunday school class today, we just touched on it briefly, the fallen human nature of me and of you is to take the path of least resistance. If we can find out, we're going to do it the easy way, and then people get rich, filthy rich, trying to figure out an easier way. Instead of... You know, we used to check you out, and you got tired of standing in line, so now we self-check out. And, and, and now we just check out online, and somebody brings it to the house. I mean, pretty soon, they're going to fix it to where we don't even have to breathe. We can just lay in the bed and be dead. And the whole world will just come to the door and just wait on us. Do our nails in the bed. Do our toes in the bed. Brush our teeth in the bed. Put on our makeup in the bed and send us a paycheck in the bed so that when we can stay up all day and never get out of the bed and then just turn over and go back to sleep in the bed. We are prone to do nothing. And left to ourself, 
without the prodding of the Holy Ghost, that's exactly what we do. We want to come to church, we don't want to do nothing. Then when the preacher finally puts us on a big enough guilt trip, we want to do something, but we want to do the very least we can do. I, I, I can't do this and I can't do that. I can't be committed to that, but I can take out the trash. Thank you very much. We needed the trash taken out, but we need you to do something besides the last day of VBS. We need you to be the entire body of Christ all the time. Jesus wants it to be that way. We need to be devoted, zealous. We need to be committed and dedicated. The question in your family should never be asked, are we going to church Sunday? That's settled when you got saved and the Holy Spirit called you out. Of course we are. Where else would we go? Don't answer that. Where else would we go? What else would we be doing? The King of glory. God who saved my soul. Forgave me of my sin. The one whose, whose breath is inside this mortal body. The one who wrote my name down in the Lamb's book of life. The, the one who stripped his son naked and whipped the hide off of him and led everybody in the world, GD his name. That, that, that God said, I'm asking you to get together for a little while in my name, in my son's name. And I'd love for you to get together and come together in the fellowship of my Holy Spirit and make a big deal out of what he did on the cross. Make a big deal out of the fact that he's still alive. And then ask him what he wants to do inside my life and through my life and all my brothers and sisters because it's a big deal where else would we go the fellowship of the spirit and our love for one another and our laboring together in the harvest is attractive to the world it's attractive to the world it says there in, in the book of Acts the church has not been born a month. But they are continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and in prayers. And then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit moves upon them to start sharing with one another in verses 45 through 46. Then they, then they start meeting in each other's houses. And it says, and God, they're praising God and they're having favor with the people, all the people. You know what that is? They're having God's giving them favor with lost people. And the Lord, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. When the church gets devoted and committed to the apostles' doctrine, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And when we start fellowshipping together and praying together and studying the Word of God together and then turning around and taking care of each other and our fellow man, the world looks at it and asks, what in the Sam Hill is going on down there at New Beginning? And you say, it's a move of God because the Spirit of God, this is a move of, listen, it ain't a move of God because you run and jump over three rows of chairs. A move of God is when He takes you and he makes you love and forgive somebody that's done chapped you off up to right here. That's a move of God. I can, jump, I can jump any chair in here with enough practice and enough running room. That ain't a move of God. People say, man, God really moved down there. What happened? Well, they jumped the chairs. I, I'm not knocking that, but a chair jumping ain't a move of God. Chair jumping is a move of man. But when, he, when God makes you committed and when God moves you to dedication, when God moves you to service, when God moves you to surrender, when God moves you to sacrifice, and it goes, everything goes against my fallen human nature. It makes my flesh mad. It makes me angry. It makes me want to stop and quit and give up and throw down my Bible and walk out. But when I stick it out and when I stay with it and I fight through it and I fight through the people not showing up, I fight through the people not coming to choir, I fight through the people not coming to keep the kids in, 
in, in the uh, nursery. I fight through the fact that you were mean to me. I fight through the fact that you talked about me on Facebook. And I fight through and I fight through. And I come anyway and I praise God because I know that God is still working. He's working in me and he's working in us. And I'm not going to let the penny ante little meandering things that happen day by day cause me to back up or give up. That is a move of God. And when people see a move of God, they want to know about God. They want to know. Man, what's going on down there? See a lot of cars in the parking lot. What y'all got going on? Man, we're just preaching. We're just praising God. I mean, y'all ain't got no quartet? No. Bozo ain't down there? So, no. Disney characters dressed up? No. Got a swimming pool? No. I mean, it's got to be something to it, right? No. Just got the Word of God. Just got the Spirit of God and got a bunch of folks that are fully, that are, as we used to say in the Marine Corps, that are highly motivated and truly dedicated. And they're romping and stomping United States Marine Corps recruits, sir. Or we could say they're romping and stomping children of the living God, sir. And God's just moved us to love one another and to preach the gospel and to build one another up. And we just, it's just overflowing. It's, it's, not, a, it's, not, it's not a church growth strategy. It's the, it's the people of God being empowered by the Spirit of God that's being brought to the Word of God and being sent out on the mission of God with the mind of God and the heart of God. That's all it is. And then it, look at what it says. In verse 43 of Acts chapter 2, Then fear came upon every soul. and Many signs and wonders were done through the apostles. Fear came upon every soul. What does that mean? They feared God in the sense that they reverenced Him and they respected Him. Now, what does that look like if you say, do you fear God? Yeah, I fear God. Well, do you fear His Word? The writer says, I tremble at His Word. It's the Word of God. If you don't, have, if you don't tremble at the Word of God, there's no fear of God. As, as Henry Blackaby said, that to tremble at the Word of God means is to understand that this is what our Almighty God has spoken. This is what our Heavenly Father demands. This is what He demands. And I am responsible for obeying it. I'm responsible for obeying it. We don't talk about obedience much in the church anymore. But God called us out so that we could be an obedient people. And He didn't ask me and you to weigh it out in the court of common opinion. And to see if it's culturally relative. To see if it still works that way anymore. He didn't call us out to do that. He gave us the keys to the kingdom. And here's what he said. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So my question is, is how do we go from Acts chapter 2 to the church of Laodicea? How do we get there? i tell you how we got there. We laid this down, and we started thinking about how it ought to be. I'm going somewhere. Don't check out on me yet. We laid this down because we got smart. And we started figuring out how it ought to be. Well, you know what? Here's, here's how we, this is what we ought to do. This is what we ought to do. One of, the, one of the men that I will never forget in my life, one of them, Two in particular, Honest Sartain and Brother James Olive here in this church so far. I won't forget them, and I talk about them because they're dead now, and I don't forget them. And if you go outside in this foyer and hang a left, you'll see both of their obituaries and their pictures in that glass box. And every time we had an elders meeting, and we were talking about, well, what do we ought to do? James Olive, every single time would listen to what everybody has to say, and we'd come around and say, well, Brother Olive, what do you say? And he'd kind of get his lips tight. And he'd kind of lean back a little bit like this. You know, he'd go. 
put his hand up there and he goes, the word of God says. He'd lead out with what the word of God says and then he'd tell us what we ought to do based on what the word of God says. Not based on what so and so is doing. Not based on what church B or C down the road is doing. Not based upon what the government is doing but based upon what the word of God says. That's how Jesus is building his church. Word of God says. That's the fear of God. Now listen. Where God is feared and his word exalted and Christ is worshipped, there will be a dedicated, committed group of believers that God can do something with. I'm going to say it again. Where God is feared, his word exalted, and Christ is worshipped, there will be a group of dedicated people in community that God can use to do big things. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 as we get ready to wrap this up. Oh, Lord, help me. I'm getting to the hard part. Ephesians 4, 7. We're going to read uh, 4, 7, and then 11 through 16. But to each one of us, somebody say each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. What that means is God has enabled every single person who comes to Christ for salvation. He's equipped you and enabled you. Verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Now pay particular attention to this verse. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. That what God wants New Beginning to be, it takes everybody in New Beginning working for. Let me see all the, let me see all the, high schoolers all the way down to elementary school in here. Uh, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Cordell, raise your hand. You're in high school. Y'all y'all raise your hands. Y'all look, raise your hand up. Raise your hand up. Raise your hand up. Okay, y'all put them down. Now let me read that again. By which every part does it share. Does it include them? All right. Just remember that when we get to the hard part. Every member matters. It says, so that we can edify ourselves in love till we grow up. If we look at the totality of that scripture in context, it means that what God wants to do in us into growing us up is not just as individuals, but as the body of Christ, and he cannot bring it to the fullness of what it should be unless every part does its share. And let me, let me put it to you this way, using the terms that I used earlier. A commuter church, a consumer church, will never reveal to the world the power of God because they can't stay together long enough to get anything done. They come in, they go out. They come in, they go out. I bet you a million people since 1998 have attended our church. We got 400 and in six months, it'll be a different 400. Some will be the same. 
many will not. In, out. In, out. Why, Pastor Randy? Because they did not continue steadfastly. They did not continue steadfastly in the doctrine of the apostles, in the assembling of themselves together, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and prayer. It's exactly why the writer of Hebrews tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, and even more so as we see the day of Christ, his return approaching but encouraging one another to stir us up to love. What does that mean? That you and I will become loveless and less and less motivated and less and less inspired unless we are around other people that hold us accountable to encourage us to love more and more. Don't quit now. It ain't going to be long. Jesus is coming. You need that. I don't need that. Well, listen, between what you think you know and what God has declared, I'm going to go with God. I'm going to go with God. And so you say, well, Pastor Randy, what, what, let, me, let me just, it's been a long time since I preached it, but let me just tell you what my job is. Did I give you Acts 6, 4? When the church was growing and they started having to give the, you know, they started the giveaway program for the widows and the orphans, and they got so many people outside the church that it became too much, the apostles said, go search out from among yourselves. In other words, I got people in this congregation that are full of the, go read it in Acts 6. I got people in this congregation, and you know who they are. Go find me six men full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom that have a good reputation among the people and set them over the affairs of the church. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. Let me just stop right there. Reading out of Ephesians 4 and out of Acts 6, who, to whom in the church falls the visitation program? You. You. You're supposed to visit one another. Well, Pastor Rain, I don't even know who those people are. And therein lies the problem. And therein lies the problem. Because God forbid that we be 15 minutes late for a sub sandwich and a ride on the lake that we would get to know the people that we just worship Jesus with. God forbid. And that's why when you get ready to have a wedding in commuter church, you don't see but four or five of your church members out there. Now, you go down here to the little country church. They got about 40 people. You get married. All 40 of them's coming, and their dogs are laying on the porch. The whole shooting match comes. But you, put, you, you, start getting, you start getting into the hundreds, and you turn around and go, man, my mom died, and one but three people from my church came. You need to be happy about them three. I'm serious. But you go down there, you, you, if you die in, in Podunkville, Alabama, everybody that lives in Podunkville is coming because they're connected, because they're a community. They're a neighborhood, and their church, they know each other. They don't just know, oh, that's brother so-and-so. But let me tell you what, I know who his daddy was, and, and he was a rounder, but now he married his wife, that boy's mama, and she settled him down, and he got saved in a revival back in 1967 filled with the Holy Ghost, and he started preaching the gospel. You go, how do you know all that? Well, I go to church with him. My job, the pastor's job, is to get the congregation to do what you think the pastor's job is. Uh, 
uh, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Well, then, uh, Pastor Ray, let me tell you what we ought to do. No, 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 no. He's already told us. Well, it don't work like that. Oh, oh yeah, it does. We just got to get back to it. What do you do? How do you shepherd a church of 400 people? I got 400 people that love Jesus and they shepherd themselves. I feed them. You know, if you feed dogs, feed goats, you feed chickens, they reproduce. The reproduction power is in the food. And so, so, so spiritual maturity and, and it is something that has to be worked on, it, and, it, and it comes with everybody doing their part. Not just the preacher doing his part, not just the song director doing his part, not just the youth leader doing their part, but everybody doing their part, to include the kids. That's why they're in here today, part of the reason. And it takes us all working together. But like Coach Saban used to say about football, it takes everybody buying in. It takes everybody buying in because you know that you've been asked, where do you go to church? And you say, I go to church at New Beginning. Very few people say, my church is. Because my church means that it infers ownership. Investment. It's my church. And until God's church becomes my church, then our church can't be what God wants his church to be. I'm going to say it again. Until God's church becomes my church, then our church will not become the church God wants it to be. It takes everybody participating and investing so that it becomes my church. Now, here's the question. Here's the question. I'm talking about everybody in this room now, particularly older people. What is your vision? What is your expectation? Probably nobody has a vision. What's your expectation for new beginning in 10 years? Because... Those kids over there will be about 12 to 14 in that other building. They're going to be 12, 14, maybe 15. What do you want New Beginning to be when, when those babies are 15 years old? What do you want it to be? You want it to be my church? You, are, are you, what, what do you want it to be? Or do you care? Man, when they get old enough, I'm out of here. Or when you die, I'm out of here. Or if they don't fire you, I'm out of here. I mean, what do you want it to be? Because whatever it is you want it to be, you got to work towards that. You can want to fly. You jump off this building, gravity is going to catch you. You better have something that will help you fly. To want something bad enough is not enough. You've got to work at it. Who has to work at it? Everybody. Everybody's got to work at it. What's the church going to be when I'm gone? What's the church going to be when Pastor Jeff's gone? What are you going to do? Are you going to keep coming to church? When the whole leadership staff is changed, eventually in time, if Jesus tarries, it will be. And you know who's going to come? You know who's going to stay? The ones who made it their church. That's who's going to be here. And right now, that ain't enough people to keep the doors open. I'm just telling you that, and I'm going to point to it in just a minute. You've got to have enough people that says it's my church. I'm going I'm to close with two stories. Lord, help me. This is where it gets sticky. Way down in Campground, Alabama. Anybody know where Campground, Alabama is? It's way down below Demopolis. You can't get there on purpose. 
There was a man who grew up down there who farmed a thousand acres of land. His name was Billy Rent. He just died a couple of years ago. He never married because he always jokingly said, I never thought I had enough money to marry a woman and keep her happy. He died a multi, multi, multi millionaire. Farming, cows, soybeans, cotton, investing wealth. And he grew up in a little church down in Campground, Alabama. Now, people that live in Campground are doing their best to move out of Campground. The younger kids are. I get it. But there's a remnant down there that stay with it. I don't know, six, eight, ten people. Little country church. But Billy Rents, that was his church. Billy Rents loved God and he loved God's church. He told his kids, he said, I'm not leaving you nothing. I mean, his nieces and nephews, he didn't have any kids. I'm not leaving you anything except that land out there, and I got it set up. You'll never be able to sell it until Jesus comes back. It's not for sale. But for any kid that I have that wants to work it and make some money, you can do it. Or you can just ride by and look at its potential. But that's all I'm leaving you, a thousand acres of dirt. Do with it what you want to. Then he told the church, his little bitty church down there in Campground, Alabama, he said, I've set up an account that has enough money in it to pay for this church to stay open until Jesus comes back pay the rent, to pay the water, I mean the power and the water, and to pay the preacher. Because I know you are older people and don't have enough money to do what you want to do and hire the kind of preacher you want. So I've, I've financed it. You're talking about vision. You're talking about doing something, putting your money where your mouth is. Didn't leave his kids a penny. Left them some dirt. And left the church millions of dollars. My church. Now I'm going to talk about one particular segment. I've been talking about all, and it is all, but I want to talk about one particular segment. Now I want everybody in this room to understand I'm not picking on anybody, I'm not airing dirty laundry. But I'm the pastor of the church, and I see a disturbing trend that's going on at New Beginning. Not just here, but I'm the pastor here, so this is the only church I can talk about. The other day, my daughter came to me, Elena. She's got a boyfriend named Caleb. He goes to another church, another denomination, actually. He goes to another school. He just graduated. They like each other. They call it love. I call it light. It ain't love till you woke up next to them about six months. If you're still over there and I'm still over here, it's got something to do with love. She said, Papa, Caleb wants me to come to his church Sunday, talking about today. And can I go? I said, no. I said, I'll let you go one time, and so I'm not infallible. Actually, I think she may have been twice. And, uh, and she said, I said, why don't you get him to come over here to our church? And she said, well, Papa, his daddy wants him to go to church with them. And I said, I would expect nothing less. I said, he needs to go to church with his family. You need to go to church with your family. This is not a dating app. We don't, we don't come here to date. This is not considered date time. This is considered worship. We're here to study God's word, pray together, laugh together, cry together, preach together. I said, you can go meet him right after church. And they are. You know, kids are going to be kids. But I said, not during church. I said, there'll come a time when you'll get older and you'll move off and you'll marry him or somebody else or he'll marry you or somebody else. And y'all will make your family and you'll go choose your church. And wherever it is that God leads him to plant you and him together and start your family right there, you take that church and you put down roots and you make it my church. But as long as you are dependent, as long as you eat my bread, 
bathe in my water and fall under the care of me as an adult, a parent, I want you to come and worship with our family. Okay. Obviously, his daddy convinced him to go to church with him because he didn't come today. And I told Elena, I said, I'm, I'm going to mention this, and it's not to pick on you, it's just to kind of make my point. Before I go further, I want to put up the David Platt picture. What if we take away the cool music and the cushioned chairs? What if the screens are gone and the stage is no longer decorated? What if the air conditioning is off and the comforts are removed? Would his word still be enough for his people to come together? And everybody goes, man, I love that. Well, let me add one. What if your boyfriend isn't here? Let me turn around. What if your girlfriend isn't here? Now, let me break it on down. What if your school friends aren't here? There's a trend where our kids are getting up to junior high age and they want to make an exodus out of the church and they want to go where their friends are. Friends that they play ball with, friends that they swim with, friends that they hunt with, and friends that they go to school with. God forbid that we would have an hour and a half that we go to church that they're not with those friends. But we've moved away from this. And we say, well, we want you to go where your friends are. A, you don't know who's teaching. B, you don't know what they're teaching. C, you don't know how your child is behaving. D, you don't know who all your child is around. A, B, C, D. E, E, they're not with you, they're family. There will be a time that your kids will move into neighborhoods and move into school and, all, and they'll do everything with their friends. But as long as they're under your house, they need to be in your family. And I got news for all the kids that want to go somewhere with their friends. Pretty soon, that group of friends, you'll have, to, you'll have to have something on Facebook and set up a reunion to meet with them because you're going to have new friends called people I work with and people I go to church with. It's a transitional stage where a bunch of whiny kids can't be away from one another, got a phone that's buzzing in their britches right now from all their friends. And you're going to let them walk out of church. Now, here's the question. If everybody's kid did that, how many kids would we have left? How many kids would we have if everybody did that? I got news for you. You don't have to. This is the part that's going to offend you. If you let them leave, starting in junior high school, going to another church, they will never come back to this church to stay. And consequently, they will never make this church their church. And pretty soon you will have a generation who has disinherited the church. And this place will be populated by very old people with a few smattering of kids, little kids. And the church will be ineffective in what God has called it to do because everybody didn't do their part. My son, this year, could not go on a trip with the junior high age kids because they did not have enough people to make the trip.
other people suffer. Other people are hindered. Who's going to teach those kids how to get committed, how to stay the course? Who's going to show them how to be the one or two? Right there is Kevin Mills. Kevin Mills was one of two youth in my youth Sunday school class at Buell Baptist Church. You know what would happen today if that were to happen? He would go to my class. He would go home and tell his mom and daddy, there's only two people in my class. I don't want to go back. And you would load up your car and haul his little nappy tail to somewhere else where they would have 50 kids. And you know what would happen? That leaves one kid. You know what they're going to do? They're not going to come either. Now we have no kids. No kids to work with the younger kids. No kids to step up and sing. No kids to lead. No kids to become the future of the church. No kids to take up the mantle. There's no next choir group. There's no next praise team. There's no next drummer. There's no next preacher. I'm not here to pick on anybody. I'm not even here to make, make you mad, although I knew it would be. But I'm here to tell you that that facilitates a commuter church mentality in your children, not a commitment mentality. It undermines the effectiveness of the church. It reinforces individualism and consumerism. It teaches that you don't have to put down roots, that when it doesn't go your way, you can just change venues, that it's all about you instead of all about us. What are you here for? How do you and your family fit into what you want this church to be in the future? What if everyone did what you're doing? Homegrown youth, those are the ones that will return and serve. Homegrown young adults, those are the ones who will return and serve. I'm telling you, time will bear it out. You don't have to, and listen, I'll, I'm, I'll listen to anybody. I, I, I won't be ugly, but I'm just going to tell you at the end of the conversation, when you get finished venting on me, I'm going to tell you that time will bear it out. If you let your kids leave here when they are young, just to go be with their friends, they're never coming back, and if they happen to come back, they'll never serve because it hasn't been enforced in their life. And what will happen to them is the same thing that's happened to our entire workforce. They want something for nothing. And let me tell you something. When you find something that costs you nothing, you have in your possession something that's good for nothing. If you want it to count, make this church, if God has led you here, your church. And even if you don't have any children in this church, make it your aim to do whatever you can to make sure the children of this church have an encounter with the living Christ and to see what it's like to be an old man in church or an older woman in church and to show them how I don't have to have any friends, I don't have to have this or I don't have to have that to come. Hunter Nelson, Hunter, are you here? Raise your hand. Raise your hand, huh? First kid in this church that ever got saved. First kid right there that was saved in this church. He was the only boy in the church. The only boy in this church. He came up through the youth program, joined the United States Air Force, learned a trade, came back, now employed by the Tuscaloosa Police Department. He's part of our security team, and he worked every night in VBS, works in children's church, works in a nursery. He works because he stayed the course. Married to some...
He's married to Savannah Hellis Nelson. Savannah grew up in this church. Went through the youth group, went through the junior high group, went through the young adult group. And now she's here serving in the church. Jana Mason, she's not here. Ain't that just like I'm going to use her for a good example? <laughs> Jana grew up in this church, came through the youth group, now works every night, works, works all the time, sings, works in the VBS, teaches. Great mama. Jesse Sartain grew up in this youth group, now uh, labors, uh, attends Sunday school, sings on the praise team, uh, heads our VBS every year. Um, Brittany Pearson Miller grew up in our youth group, serves now in the church, in the children's church and in the nursery, worked every night in VBS. Brianna Campbell, Brianna, where are you? Brianna here? Brianna Campbell, still now here, came up through our youth group, uh, is currently in our young adult group, just went on a mission trip to Montana, serving the Lord, and now she uh, worked every night in VBS. Watch this. Time will bear it out. Andy Kelly finished up his youth group here in this church. Went off to the United States Navy, came back, equipped to make a good living for himself, got employed in a great business, advanced in it. Now he and his wife head up our daycare, and they work in our children's ministry. They work in our BBS. And all I'm telling you is this. There's a pattern to the ones that stay and the ones that serve. And there's a, an alternative pattern to the ones that leave early who never come back. And most of the time, wherever they land, they don't serve because it's been ingrained in them that you go when it don't fit and you stay until it don't fit and then you go again. And that is not how you build your church. That is not how Christ builds the church. I'm not saying that this church is for everybody. It may not be for anybody. It may just shut the door. But I'll tell you this, wherever it is that God leads you, Daddy, you better take your wife and you better take your kids and wait for playtime to be playtime and date time to be date time, but worship time and serve time and God's time to be God's time and worship time and serve time. Because if you don't, you're going to find yourself smack dab in the middle of the church of Laodicea. If you don't, you're going to find yourself smack dab in the middle of the church of Laodicea. Let's stand to our feet. Lord, I don't suspect anybody's going to jump the pews. But what I do hope is that your spirit has spoken to us and that we'll go somewhere and sit down and instead of talking to other people and other parents and other kids about what we should do, I pray, Lord God, this is my prayer, that every person would open these scriptures that we read today. Matthew 16, Acts 2, Ephesians 4. And say, Lord, am I out of line? Am I doing my part? How can I change this church to my church so that it becomes our church through which you can be glorified? That's all I ask. I can't do that, but you can do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a few.